Hello, 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 everyone. Today I am with the amazing Drake, former Drake standout, um, Drake University, as well as overseas professional ball player, Josh Young. How you doing, Josh? It's good to see you today. Hey, it's good to be here today. Thanks for having me. Good, 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 good. So, Josh, obviously, uh, we met on Clubhouse. But I want to know, I don't know your whole story. And, you know, part of it is I want to know, I'm always curious when people kind of like end up in the pros and whatnot, when was the first time you sort of either picked up basketball or, or I'm sometimes I'm even curious, was it your first sport? So tell me a little bit about how you got started. I know that one of the first uh, presents that my parents bought me was a basketball hoop. And so that was early on, two, yeah. three years old. So it was the first sport in that sense. But actually, the first sport that I participated in where I was competing against other individuals was track. And awesome. so at five years old, I started running track. And actually, I ran track from the time I was five to the time that I was 18. Um, my dad was a basketball coach mm -hmm. when I was young. And he actually was my high school basketball coach. So I was just around the game. I was always in the gym after school. I would just sit there wow. until they finished practice. And so that's how basketball came into my life. Uh, and then I ended up picking up that as a competitive sport by the time I was, I was nine years old. And that was really the start to what has turned into a long, very long career. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And kudos. I mean, that's great, right? Having a long career. So you were a runner. I don't know if you know, but I ran track. Uh, I ran all the way up to uh, Michigan State. So pretty cool. Um, what was your events? So I ran the one, the two, uh, the relays, four okay. by one, and the 400. The four, um, yeah, that was my race, the four. <laughs> so. And the 400. Awesome. Which was like a, which is, when I was a kid was like a long distance run. Yeah. And then when I started getting older, I'm like, oh, this is a, this is like a sprint. This, yeah. is, this is a different race than when I was a young kid. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So your dad, was he your coach all along or only when you got to high school? When I got to high school, he was okay. my coach. Okay. Um, I had other coaches. So you got introduced to the sport at nine or you picked it up as a competitive sport um, were you automatically good or were you, did you go through some struggles or, you know, tell me a little bit about your journey with that. <laughs> I was talented. Um, and I think a lot of that was just genetics. Both of my parents are athletes. Um, and then the other part of that was kind of what I was alluding to earlier is I was always in the gym just by default. And so just by being in the gym, I naturally had a basketball in my hands, learned how to dribble. Um, learn how to shoot. My dad hosted a lot of basketball camps in the summer. So way before I played competitive basketball, I had been going to camp for years. Oh, okay. So that was that was something that helped me really cultivate my skills and hone my skills by the time I um, was ready to, to hit the hardwood and really compete against other people. That's pretty awesome. Did you feel any pressure to play basketball or did you actually really like it? I, I loved it. Okay. I, I still love it. All it right. Was, I'm sure you do. You still play it. But I mean, you know, just yeah. when you're starting, I never know when you have a dad that, you know, or a parent that plays the sport. I'm always curious. So, yeah, it was a sports family for sure. Like even my uncles, my aunts. Um, but it was there was never any pressure on me. Like, yo, you got to play basketball. Yeah. It was just something that I enjoyed and ended up picking up. Cool. So um, obviously this podcast is called The Mental Advantage. When do you remember like being introduced to the mental game or the mental aspect? Were you seeing that in track and field? Because like when we're more talented, you know, just speaking for myself, I didn't have like a lot of awareness of that. So what, you know, I, I was just relying on my talent. When did you kind of start kicking into the mental aspect of the sport, would you say? I would say that that happened in high school um, and I actually was introduced to that indirectly by my father because yeah. he used to tell me always that you got to you got to envision the game. You got to see the game before the game. Um, and I actually took it to heart. So I would do that. I would I would see myself making shots. I would see myself being successful in different uh, areas of the game, really getting into the zone and getting into a flow. And so I would say when I was 14, 15 years old, um, I had already started to use the mental side of the game as a competitive advantage. That's awesome. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Like, for, you know, like that's not a common thing for people to have that. But I'm, I'm, as I'm having these interviews, I'm starting to see a lot of people kind of have like these natural inclinations to certain things. And uh, definitely awesome that you are using visualization because that's such a big tool, as we know, for the mental aspect. So what was your, um, what is your current position with basketball? So I play point guard, shooting oh. guard. I'm a combo guard. Yeah, can, got it. You're like, I can shoot, I can draw, you know, run. I handle the ball, I can shoot, I can, yeah. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. So when, what was the difference? So you played for your dad most of your life. Um, was there ever a moment where, and I know I'm not trying to cause any discord, but was there ever a moment where you were kind of like, this is tough being coached by my dad? Cause some people love it. Some people don't. So just curious, like how that experience was. I mean, obviously he gave you some tools and indirectly you took them, like you said, to heart, but was there any challenges with playing for your dad? Yeah, there were quite a few challenges. Uh, my dad is great, and mm -hmm. we were able to talk about this now, but at the time, being a 15-year-old young man, up until the time that I was 18 and playing for my father, was a challenge. It was a big challenge. I think there's two different types of parents when it comes to coaching their kids. Mm -hmm. There's the parent that really lets everything slide, and it's just, you know, their kid gets to play. It doesn't matter how good they are. Mm -hmm. And then there's the parent on the opposite end who's just like really tough on their kid and, you know, blames things on them. Uh, and I had the latter. And so my dad was extremely tough on me. Um, it wasn't anything that um, had me backing down from the challenge of the sport. Right. I just thought, hey, maybe a little encouragement here and there would, would be cool. <laughs> but he he knew what he saw in his son mm -hmm. and he really just pushed it to the brink to get everything it was like he was squeezing the lemon <laughs> and he was going to squeeze the last drop of what was in there right right awesome yeah that's um you know obviously that right parents see their potential in their kids and they you know they drive the best but some parents can do the coaching and some parents feel like yeah maybe i'm not the right person to be coaching my own kid so you, you said you ran track to 18. You were very good at basketball. Was there ever a time that it was a decision between the two going to college or was it like, definitely it's going to be basketball? Yeah, actually. So I played, I also played baseball. Oh, wow. Three sport athlete. Okay. Yeah, I played baseball. I dabbled in football and my mom took me out of that quickly. Um, but baseball, I loved, I really, really loved baseball. And when I got to high school, that was the point where I decided it's time to specialize because I saw my gains on the basketball court. I saw that there was a lot of potential there. Um, and I, and I knew that if I really devote my time to this, this is where I can for sure go play uh, beyond high school. Okay, so I continued to run track because track was just like stay in shape. Yeah. Um, but I did specialize when I got to the 10th grade. Um, but I'm very thankful that I was playing a, a lot of different sports up until that time. Well, yeah, I mean, they talk about the benefits of obviously playing multiple sports and, uh, you know, good that you had that instinct to specialize and I mean, obviously it paid off because you, you have a long term career in basketball and right. uh, and there's much more of an upside on basketball than there is on track and field because that's kind of an Olympic thing and, you know, minus absent um, sponsorships, it can be a tough road for some athletes. So you're, uh, you know, obviously going through uh, high school, did you win any championships? Uh, and it's okay if you didn't, I'm just curious, like if you felt like there was a different level of what you needed to be at that level in high school, or were you guys just, you know, like, I mean, well, you can tell me, did you win any championships? <laughs> uh, I, I did, it was a different dichotomy for me because I went to a really small school. Okay. So my school was a private school there in Lawton, Oklahoma. And my dad, like I said, was um, my coach. So right. he worked with school. Um, we won two back-to-back -back state championships. Nice. My junior and senior year. And the problem for me, or that I, I saw at the time, was that this is such a small school. I'm trying to play college ball. Uh, I really need to transfer to one of these 6A schools. So even though we in our regular season played all the way up to 6A schools, when we got to these playoffs, we're playing small private schools just like us. Um, and I saw that as being very problematic. I'm like, hey, I need, I need eyes on me. I need exposure. Um, and my dad would say always, 
you know, son, if you can play basketball, they'll come find you. Mm-hmm. So he always told me every time I tried to transfer, that was always yeah. that was always his response to me. Um, and ultimately, he was he was right. <laughs> he was right. Like, oh, he was right. All right. So tell me about so because this is this is awesome because you know you see those moments. So like obviously you win these championships. Your dad's saying, hey, someone's gonna find you. You're a good player. When, do you remember when you got that first letter and who was it from? Was it from the school you ended up going to, or was it like, you know, I just tell me about that first letter that was like, Hey, we're interested in you. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't even a letter. It was an in-person visit. Oh, it was from the coaches after my sophomore year, the coaches of Missouri state mm-hmm. came to my school and, you know, my dad was like, Hey, there's a school here to see you. And it was them. And, they watched me practice and then after practice we sat down with my parents and they were like hey we want to offer you a scholarship wow. which was very shocking yeah maybe one of the most shocking moments of my life because i would i remember thinking in my head how did you even know i exist right exactly <laughs> i'm in this little school no one ever comes here there's no scouts there's right. no it's not like people are on social media and you're getting you know retweeted right. and it was none of that right. um but that was the first introduction that I had to uh, the next step and what was going to be my next move. And I remember just being so exciting. And then there were more that, that followed thereafter. So ha- so you had lots of offers. Obviously, you can't commit in your sophomore year, correct? You do it. There's signing day and it happens in your senior year. Or when does signing day exactly happen? Yeah, so there's signing day, which is uh, typically... They'll have one in the fall, and then they'll also have one in the spring. But you can verbally commit when you're 14 if you want. Oh, okay. Um, Got it. Until you actually sign that letter of intent, it's not binding. You're a minor. But most people, when they verbally commit, uh, own up to the words that they, they've committed to. They follow through. Okay. So you obviously got multiple offers. How do you decide on um, Drake University? What was, the, what was the deciding factor in that instance? Yeah. I I knew that I wanted to go somewhere that was going to provide me with the opportunity to maximize my educational opportunities. Um, my parents being educators played a big role in that. They were really big on that piece and always were like, hey, basketball is not going to last forever. You don't ever know what's going to happen. So let's make sure you're squared away there. And then for me, I wanted to go somewhere where I felt comfortable. Mm-hmm where I felt wanted, like really wanted. I wanted to be somewhere where they really wanted me and also a place where I could see myself coming in and having an impact pretty pretty immediately. Got it. Um, I was confident in my ability to play. I knew I was a, a next level, but I also knew that I worked really hard. And yeah. so I was ready to, to take that step. And I think Drake, or I know that Drake ended up offering all three of those possibilities for me. I just, I just knew that we could do something special there, even though they were 20 years straight losing seasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, 20 straight losing seasons. Uh, wow. When I to go there. Um, but I, as a 17 year old kid, just thought I have some vision here for my life, uh, but really for what we could do in this program, I think that it's really primed and ready for, for a comeback. Okay. There. I love that. Okay, so you get to college. Your dad's not your coach anymore. You've been wanting to get to a bigger, you know, kind of a bigger pond, so to speak. What's that experience like? What's the difference between high school and college? Like, you know, and coming into a school that has 20 losing seasons. You've got a vision, but, you know, what's the coach like? How's that whole transition? The transition was really smooth. I think the co- the coaching staff was um they were great. They were players, coaches, um, they were really personable. They liked me. <laughs> um, all, all those things really helped. But I think the biggest thing that helped me was the person that they paired me with in the summer as my roommate. And the reason I say that is because they couldn't have picked a bigger workhorse. I mean, this guy showed me immediately, you want to be good here? This is what it's going to take. Oh. And I remember when I think back on it now, it was a little OD because we would go to the gym from eight to 12 
And then we'd go home, take a little break from 12 to like two. And then we'd go back from two to six. Wow. Almost every day, five days a week, the whole summer. And I'm thinking you could get a lot done in half the time. Yes. And, you know, 80%, like 20% of that time. But we, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world because before I came home, I think I got to Drake in the beginning of June. And then I came back beginning of July and I had already gained 10 pounds and my parents were like, Hey, your body's already changing. And, and yeah. just the work ethic, you know, he really taught me how to work. Um, and so the transition was really smooth, not just because of those factors, but also because of someone who, who showed me the way. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Like, look, I, and I love how, like, you know, of course it's like, they happen to, right. But it's like everything that, you know, the universe just so sets us up for the next level. Yeah. Right. So did you, uh, while during your, your, your term there, because you played four years, all four years, were you able to start all four years? Um, and did you kind of change something about this whole 20 and <laughs> losing? Seasons? Uh, I will say that we did. Okay. Um, well, right, not you, right? Not you personally, but yeah. <laughs> my time there. Uh, I, so I did. I, I think it took me maybe a little bit before half of the season, um, before the coaches were like, hey, you need to start. Okay. I was in running for freshman of the year, uh, newcomer of the year, my, my first season. Um, and actually, my very first year, we went 17 and 15. Wow. So we broke the 20-year losing streak. Yeah. And we have what's called the top four because Drake is in Iowa. So Iowa State, yeah. you and I, and Iowa. And so you play all of those schools. You play you and I twice and then Iowa and Iowa State. And then the winner of all of those is the winner of the top four. Okay. And we beat all of them. We beat you and I twice and we beat um, Iowa and Iowa State, which was the first time in like 40 years to win in Hilton. Wow. The first time we beat Iowa in 30 years, something crazy. Um and so that was a big moment for, for our fans. And it set us up for what turned out to be one of the best years in Drake history the following year, when we were picked to finish ninth. And we had a group of guys really selfless, very intelligent, could yeah. really shoot the basketball really skilled. Um, and we ended up being the 14th best team in the country and going 28 and five, getting a number five seed in the NCAA tournament. And from that point, really just changing and putting Drake University on the map. So it was a really amazing start to my to my <laughs> talk about it. Like, right. Like you first of all, your freshman, you had a vision. You're like, I can make an impact here. Uh, your freshman season, you guys successfully turned the, you know, the break the curse, you know, and I put that in quotes because, you know, we don't know if those things actually exist, but we we tend to think <laughs> they do. I, I come from Chicago with the curse of the goat with the Cubs and stuff like that. They right, right. One, so that's not a thing anymore, I guess. But then you go to your sophomore season. Now, um, it, I, maybe you didn't win a national championship, but how was it in the NCAA tournament? Because you probably maybe were dreaming about this for a while. So do you remember what it was like, you know, going to the tournament? Can you tell us a little bit about that? The whole entire road to that point was crazy. I mean, if you were playing for a program that loses for 20 straight years and then you have a <laughs> semi-successful season right when you start inching towards the top 25 at drake university people are like you know hey this is crazy and yeah. the locker room pop was like you guys think we can do this and they were like yeah we can do it let's win a couple more games and then we were inching up to like 50 and then 40 and then 33 and then we had to play creighton in creighton where they hadn't lost to a top 25 team in years wow so the first game we cracked the top 25 nice and <laughs> So we went there and were able to to beat them. And from there, we took off. I don't think we lost a game for three months. We we went on a 21 game winning streak. Um, and so leading up to the tournament, all of that was surreal. When, when we did selection Sunday, they packed out an entire side of our arena with fans that just wanted to be there wow. to see what was going on. And yeah, the the atmosphere, the electricity, everything was just so crazy surrounded. The city was so proud. The state was so proud. Yeah. So when we flew, to, we, we drew um, uh, our location in Tampa. 
Mm-hmm. So we fly down to Tampa, you know, the police meet you at the at the airport and then they escort you. Hotel is full of Drake. Welcome Drake to the NCAA tournament. Wow. It was just the coolest thing. I think for any young athlete um, that wants to play any sport and basketball in this case, right. the NCAA tournament is a dream and it lives up to everything that you can imagine. All the blue carpet and and they really just roll out the red carpet for you. Wow. It's, it's really cool. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. I see. I love because it's great to hear from the perspective of the athlete what that's like, right? Because we see it as the fans, right? And get the brackets and all that. But it's different when you're actually the team on the court. Okay. Yeah, playing. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you're finishing out. So you, you had that season where you just took Drake to another place. You put it on the map. What happens junior, senior season, um, you know, like as you finish out your career? Yeah, so one of the College career, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, my college career. So so one of the things that happens when you experience so much success is that you become very wanted. Um, and that's what happened to my coach. Mm. It was the first, it was his first year as a head coach ever. Yeah. He's 25. He's a top 25 team coach. Right. Um, and you know, college coaches make decent money, but at Drake, maybe I don't know. Yeah, not quite the Duke, right. <laughs> And so the Big East comes calling. They put $7 million on the table, guaranteed. Wow. And he couldn't, he couldn't turn it down. He's got a family. He's got, Understandable. Um, and it wasn't even his first, it wasn't even his first offer. I'm talking Stanford and Cal and Oregon and all, all kinds of teams were coming. He was turning them down because he knew what he had created. Who are going to do it again next year? Right. So he leaves, we bring in a new coach and um, it was, a little more difficult at that point. Just a lot of changing. Things were just different. Wow. Um, and so I, I ended out my, I think my junior season doing okay. I, I had led the conference in scoring my sophomore year. Okay. So my junior year I was maybe top five and my senior year was even worse than that. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was a struggle to get to the finish line, I think you yeah. could say. Um, but, you know, the things that aren't working for us, I believe are working on us. And that was one of the periods in my life that that whole ordeal was really working on me um, and actually helped me to become the player that I am today. Mm. Well, I got to say more about that and say that quote again, because I think people are going to need to hear it. So say it one more time. Yes. Uh, I think you're referring to when I said that the things that aren't working for us, I believe are working on us. Yes. Um, and that was one of the situations in my life that I didn't see it at the time. Uh, when I look back on it now, it was really, really working on me and uh, trying my patience, um, my character. There were so many things that were going through the fire in that time. Um, and, and luckily, I was able to pass all of those, those tests. But I, at one point, very strongly considered quitting basketball. Mm. to the point that I took I don't know six job interviews after my senior season wow Um, and I just was imagine loving something so much and in the span of one season just being gutted like you don't want to even play anymore and that's where I found myself um but that's why my my support system my family is so great the people that are around you there it's your environment's so important um but I had people that were really encouraging me, like, hey, what's wrong with you? I, I, I broke the all-time scoring record at school. Like, someone who breaks an all-time scoring record wants to quit basketball after the season? That makes no sense. <laughs> uh, and so I, I stuck with it. And uh, now I can tell you, I sit here today glad that I did. All right. So I, I want to ask, because I think, well, I think it's also important to highlight that, like, sometimes coaches can be the difference between someone's and yeah, you have a natural joy for the sport, but coaches either sort of, uh, what's the word, light that fire or keep that fire lit. Let me say help keep that fire lit. And then some coaches kind of really challenge you. And yet while there can be a lot of lessons that we walk away, I think it's really important for any coaches that are listening to like really make sure because when you got your, because for me, it's like, I guess my question would be, did you ever think about following your coach? Was that ever an option? I know you committed to Drake, but how does that work? And is that not allowed? 
but I'm sure when you were going through the tough time, was it like, maybe I should see if he'll take me? <laughs> was it yeah. anything like that? Um, they, they asked me and I considered it, it would have been a step up. I actually had a lot of college coaches calling me at that point, but the way that I saw it was we're bringing back 80% of our team that just won 28 games. Right. And the guys that we're bringing in to replace the guys that are leaving are potentially even better in terms of skill. And so I just think I thought at the time, it's a no brainer. Like it would be really difficult for this to not work out. <laughs> and I, I was wrong, obviously. Um, but I was very loyal to Drake. Drake was great for me. Yeah. Um, and I think for, for athletes today, it's really tough because college coaches can get up and leave and go work and they can work the next year. Mm -hmm. But if the player tries to leave, they have to sit out for a year. Yeah. Even if the coach is gone, you know, it's, it's a really interesting um, situation, I think. Maybe one that the NCAA should look into. I, I um, agree. Yeah, yeah because my dad says that, you know, we, people say you commit to the university, but actually you commit to the coach because the coach is the person that comes to right. your house and they're Just the ones right you. Left. Right. You don't know anything about the university. Right. The only thing that you know is the window you perceive the university through, which is the team that you're committing to. Agreed. And, um, yeah. So, so really, really an interesting concept, but I had thought about all of those things, but I just decided that I wanted to be with my guys. I wanted to stay with my team. I knew that we could do something special again. I was convinced of it. Very, very convinced of it. Um, so that's why I made the decision. To you, had, you had battled with these guys. You had won. You, I mean, I could see that. Like, it's like, yeah, I could go and serve self or I could stay here and we're building something amazing. And so I see why you didn't leave, you know, because just like you said, we, so like you're a we guy, you know? And so yeah. that's why you don't leave because the, the me guy would have left, but you're not a me guy. <laughs> I, that I'm not, I'm, I'm not a me guy. I, uh, I, it, and it, you know how it is in sports. You just, you go through things with people and it, yeah. it creates this bond. And we had gone through so much and we had worked so hard and we had built something that no one had ever built there. Um, and then as soon as my coach left the reporters, everyone was asking, so are you transferring? Are you leaving? Yeah, exactly. I was like, no, I'm, no. I don't think so. I'm going to stay. Right. right. <laughs> Are you, are you gonna take all of us can you just take all of us to the new school yeah. right that's so okay. interesting that I definitely think the NCAA should change that so we're saying that now NCAA please change that because yeah you're right coaches mm -hmm. don't have to sit out for a year but players do you're right they yeah. you do need more player centric rules for the NCAA in general which is where the uh name image and likeness NIL is possibly going to come in and we're looking for you know some more player you know um uh, favorable policies that would be great and actually to your point i think what you asked about the the impact yeah this on players lives i think that i'm not sure that coaches always understand that aspect exactly of how much you can mold and shape a young man or young woman's future mm -hmm. in the time that you have them in your care and it's not even just about developing these basketball players or soccer players or track stars or, or any of those things. You right. have human beings who you spend, who spend the majority of their day in your care, mm -hmm. under your leadership. And as a leader, it's your job to bring out their greatest strengths, mm -hmm. right? To, sh to show them where they can be better as people and in their respective sports, right? And so to have someone who either speaks negatively to someone or treats uh, the athlete negatively, it could really kill a career. And I think about had I quit basketball, oh man, I wouldn't have experienced life yeah. in the way that I've experienced it in the, in the last years. I wouldn't have met half of the people that I've met. So right. many things in life would have been so different had I allowed that experience to, to keep me from pushing forward in something right. that I knew I should be doing. Um, and a lot of people, for me, I'm, I'm very grateful that I had that support system to help me do that. But for a lot of people, they might just say, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do it. Yep. I'm and so thankful for your growth. All right. We don't get to know Josh Young as a professional ball player if that, that conversation doesn't take place, because obviously it wasn't 
the coaching staff. It wasn't, you know, like that person that was pulling you back from the brink. It was your family, which is great because, you know, um, so fabulous, fabulous. So you're graduating. Um, you're thinking about quitting basketball. A conversation happens and then you're like, Okay, so talk to talk. Tell me a little bit about that transition because at this point, if you're thinking about quitting basketball, I'm assuming you're not having. Are you getting prospects from? How's that work with the NBA? Like, what's the next step? Yeah, so the kind of the battle that was taking place was in my head. Mm -hmm. To everyone else, I'm the all-time leading scorer at Drake. Yeah, and so I have I have um, a lot of agents hitting me up on Facebook, finding my numbers and the emails. Gotcha. Um, and then I decided like, I should meet with some of these people. If I'm in this undecided phase, let me meet. So yeah. some agents flew out to, to Drake, uh, met with a few of them, ended up finding one that I really connected with. Um, we talked about, you know, what's the plan going forward. And he, he laid it out. This is what we're gonna do. Uh, I'll have some NBA workouts for you. And those things and so we were able to um, get a couple NBA workouts uh, and then ultimately what ended up happening from those workouts is that I ended up having my name uh, put into the D-League draft mm. um, which I didn't know was going to happen actually right. okay. um, I, didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen um, and then from there uh, things just kind of progressed forward into to my professional career, I was drafted in the third round of the D-League draft, went to Austin um, for training camp with the Toros. That didn't work out for me. Uh, and then that started uh, kind of the search for clubs overseas. Um, and then that's how I, how I progressed in that direction. So let's go back just a little bit. You're having these workouts. Um, you know, you, first of all, you got an agent. He lays out the plan. Was the plan to go to the D-League? Now we say, I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, what was the plan? And how did the D-League draft, was it part of the plan? I mean, you said it didn't know it was going to happen, but was it part of the trajectory that was projected? Or was it like, ah, uh, we were thinking playing for the actual NBA, I know it's the same organization, but different leagues, but, yeah. you know, tell me a little bit more about that and how are you feeling? So yeah, tell me that part and then I'll ask the next question. So, okay. So it was, I think every kid, I yeah. mean, in my era, right. now you can ask me today, they will literally tell you, I want to play overseas. Yeah. But in my era, no one woke up dreaming about overseas. <laughs> Everyone was dreaming about the NBA. Right. Um, and for me, I, I had NBA scouts looking at me during college, so it wasn't such a far-fetched idea that I would be a brink player. Um, and so what happened was I had these NBA workouts. I was in Houston first, and then I actually had a, a workout with a team out of Tulsa, which is a G League team. Okay. And, and I worked out with them, and it was a really great workout. Um, and so after that workout, I remember they brought me to the side, and they were talking to me, and they said, hey... Um, we want to be honest with you. We actually think you have a chance to be an NBA point guard. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, okay. But at the time I'm thinking, I'm sure you say this to everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> taking it with a grain of salt. They're like, so we're going to contact your agent. We, we want to set something up for you. And I was like, oh, okay. So my agent calls me and he's like, hey, you know, the, they called me and they, they told me that you're, you just killed this workout. And um they want to set you up with the thunder actually and i was like oh okay and so i get a call i'm sitting in my sister's living room uh i say hey this is such and such with the oklahoma city thunder uh you know our uh, g league affiliate reached out to us they think that you'd be a person that we should bring in for this training camp and uh and i was like wow i i really didn't expect it like i know that they were saying all of this but i was just like I, yeah and so what happened is i ended up working out for the thunder for maybe the next month which was, when I tell you I was living three minutes from their practice facility, I'm from, I live in Oklahoma City. Yeah. I was like a hometown kid, you know, it was crazy. Um, and, and I did that for, yeah, about a month. Um, but then when it came down to making the cuts, I just, I didn't, I didn't go to the next level. Okay. Um, and so, but what happened was they said, but we want you to play for our affiliate team because we think yeah. we can develop you in this system. So all of that was worked out and I was ready to, to play for them. Then I think the night before the G League draft, 
I get a call from the office in New York. Yeah. And they're like, hey, this is, uh, you know, the G League office in New York. And we were calling to inform you that uh, your name has been brought up on multiple teams radar. And we're going to have to enter your name into the draft. To that point, I wasn't going to be in the draft. I was just signing it like a free agent. You were just going, yeah. I was just going, yeah. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I guess they'll draft me. And then Austin drafted me. I don't know anyone in Austin. I don't know the coach. I don't know what's going on down there. Wow. Yeah. And so it was the weirdest thing. So my everyone in my family is like watching this. They're like, oh, congrats. And I'm like, I don't know anybody. Yeah, exactly. Like, what happened? I knew I was going to Oklahoma. No idea. Um, and so that's how I made it to Austin. And <laughs> cool experience. Austin was a great city. Um, but like I said, it just, it didn't work out. I was there. I think they had like four or five veteran point guards mm -hmm. that were playing last season in the G League. So I'm like, and and a couple of them were on that team. I'm like, there's not even space for a guard here. Yeah. But um, it was okay because I, I'm a firm believer in in giving everything you can to situations and yeah. more where they're supposed to be. So that is how I uh, ended my short stint in America. Yeah. <laughs> And started searching for opportunities overseas. So I saw an article and I, you know, I, cause I do a little research on my guests before I have them. So I want to know, uh, you said something about like, do you, well, do you feel like the Tulsa thing messed with your mind? Like the, your, your mindset, because you kind of thought, I mean, I understand you didn't know anyone there, but like, and of course you're going to go and you're going to do your best, but you, I, I, you said something in this article about not having confidence or not feeling as confident. So was that there when you were playing with the Thunder? Was it there when you were playing with the Tulsa people? Cause you like, you killed that workout. So yeah. do you think the displacement of going to Austin contributed to that? Because you had always been minus the, even though you said like to the outside, you were the number one scorer at, you know, leading the conference um, to the outside, you were kind of the guy, but what happened in the NBA was that kind of rocking your confidence that that process yeah that's a really good question I I think that that was a combination of the residue from my last season yeah uh, in college because I think that if you don't if you don't tackle things head on they just kind of linger you know I think a lot of times in life even sports uh, things happen and, and we don't directly face them, you know, and I didn't, I just kind of swept it under the rug, like, oh, this happened, you're yeah. tough, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know the lingo, you're yeah. tough, just keep going, like, whatever. Yeah, you got this, right. Yeah, and, uh, and so I did that, and then on top of that, with the, the me thinking I was going somewhere and then wow. ending up somewhere else, I'm sure that did, didn't help, I'm sure it all contributed to right. it, but I just remember not having as much confidence as I had had before mm. and that's a really that's a really tough thing to um you know come to grips with when yeah. you are just you know what how important it is to have confidence right. and you know what it's like to have confidence and then you're just like yo you gotta get your confidence back man yeah um, and I I just didn't have it at that point and yeah. I think that's the, the article that you're referring to I was yeah uh really candid about that yeah. So, well, first and foremost, obviously, we we still there's there's a happy ending to this, right? So, you're obviously you know you 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 go to at Austin, you're seeing there's like 75 point guards. I know I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> they, they have more than you they need, and you're kind of like, okay, I don't know how I fit into this. It doesn't work out. Um, at that point, you have an agent still. I, I'm assuming you still have the agent, same guy. Okay. So at what point is it like, okay, that didn't work out. Do I go for another team? I got cut from Astros or whatever. I'm done with them. Do I go to another team or, I mean, is the conversation that, or is it like, Hey, maybe we should look overseas. How's that? You know, tell me a little bit about that transition. Yeah. So the conversation was, let's try the overseas market. Okay. Um, and actually it wasn't, so much that we were saying let's try it but that teams were already reaching out to my agent mm, got it uh, and so when i was released from that situation 
there were already other situations overseas that were kind of brewing up. Gotcha. Um, and then we were, were able to make a decision. And to be honest, they weren't, they weren't like, I, I wasn't so impressed with yeah. <laughs> opportunities. I was like, oh, and that's okay. That's yeah. not great. Um, but in the, in the weirdest way, I felt like they think I can't play basketball, mm. but I can. And, and yeah. now it's time to show people I can play basketball. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So just, just really, like really just trying to pump myself back up. Yeah. Uh, was where I found myself at that moment. Well, that's, I mean, th that's great. I think, yeah, exactly. It's like, Hey, you know what? Um, this is like, I love those pivot points. Right. Because like, you know, the, I'm going in this direction. I thought, and now this didn't work out, but hold on, this is not who I am. I need to, you know, so how long between the Astros and the first season overseas? What, it looks like you've been playing Germany the whole time. You don't know anyone in Germany, similar to Austin. So what's that like going overseas? <laughs> Tell me about your first, you know, experience with all that. I remember very vividly, it was my first time in an international terminal, right? So I fly to Atlanta and then I'm flying overseas. I didn't even know international terminals existed. I'm never flying internationally. So why would I ever be in an international right. terminal? And then I just remember thinking like, it even smells different. Here. <laughs> and even to this day, when I'm in the international terminal, I smell the smell of the international terminal. It's just a different smell. Yeah, you know? For sure. Um, and the same thing when I landed in Germany, it was December, so it was really cold and there was snow on the ground. But I just remember being like, man, it smells like, it smells like people and cigarettes or something <laughs> like that type of combination. European yeah. smoke, that's what they do. Oh yeah, for um, sure. And and just seeing like the architecture and the cars and being on the Autobahn and how fast people were going. I was like, what in the world? Just really just a culture shock in a sense, but I've always been the type of person that adapts really well to new environments. And so it did, it wasn't overwhelming. It was just like, this is all so new to me, but very, but also very cool. Um, a really cool, really cool introduction to um, the overseas life. Now, did they, um, obviously overseas, they're recruiting you, the coach, does he speak English? Are you having to have a translator? How does that work? I mean, cause I know like, it's, you know, it's not, it's not so outside of the realm that a German, you know, team would have an English speaker on it. But I'm just curious how is because yeah. I watched the Ball brothers and like their coach didn't speak any English. So right, right, right. They were in Lithuania. That's a different yeah, I know it is a different situation. Um, but yeah, and it just depends on the country. For example, you go to Spain, Spanish coaches don't speak English, they speak Spanish. That's why most people within two years of playing in Spain speak Spanish because of that fact. German is a little more lenient, or Germany is more lenient, and uh, everyone here that has any type of education speaks English. Okay. So it just so happened that the coach that I had that first season was from Chicago. So he was, <laughs> he was an American and I, I really expected like Heinz or something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was, it was Chris and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, which, was, which was a godsend for me because um, he is the person and now that we're talking about it, I gotta make sure I send him a message of thinking about this. Yeah. The person that gave me my confidence back mm. in, a, in a very big way, very big way. So I've always had the ability to shoot. Um, I, was, I was young, I was 22 years old. I was yeah. really fast. My jumping ability was crazy. And uh, I remember I would just be working out with the team the first days and we were doing shooting drills. And I was just like, I just don't miss that often. Yeah. At the time. And he's like, man, this kid can really shoot. I didn't think that he, he, I remember him telling me like, he didn't think, he didn't know the caliber of player he was getting. I had signed into the third division in Germany. Mm. And the reason I did that is because I didn't think I was a third division player. I was like, I'm definitely a first division player. But if you're a first division player, you'll go to the third division and prove it. That's just how I, that's just how I saw it. I went back to my dad telling me, if you can play, they'll find you. They'll find you. All that coming back into play. And I remember my coach said to me, when you come off of ball screens, if they go under the ball screen, you shoot it. I don't care if it's 50 times. You right. shoot it every single time. 
And that was the type of confidence he had in not just my shooting ability, but just me as a player and my decision making. And that confidence translated very quickly into, into personal success and success for our team. And so I'm really, really grateful to him for that. That's awesome. I, yeah, I love that. You know, it's not the first time I've heard a coach telling you just to keep shooting helps build confidence. And I think that's important for a lot of young players and people playing the game to know that the more you shoot, I mean, obviously someone believing that you can take the shot is going to help as well. And obviously you still have to take the shot, but you had obviously a good uh, percentage, as you said, like you were putting up good yeah. numbers. So you're in division three. Um, mm -hmm. And you're now, are you in division one now, or is that, is that where we're at yeah. first division? Okay. Tell me, you know, obviously, cause we want to like, you know, make sure we bring it home. Like what has been your favorite moment in Germany? Is the basketball that different? Like what's the difference or the feeling of being a professional ball player overseas? Cause I hear it's like, like almost NBA iconic status, but you know, tell me more about that. Yeah, it's really unique. Um, we are American basketball players here. One, we're foreigners. Yeah. You know? um, and, and I think the level of the league over the years has increased a lot. They made a, a rule, I want to say like five, six years ago, where they changed it to where you couldn't just have all Americans on a team. You had to at least have six homegrown players on each team so it was better for the germans because now they can have their talent in the first league right right and i think at first people were like ah the league's gonna be but what it did is actually it made the league better uh, because it decreased the amount of spots that each team has to bring in new people so if right. you're a foreigner there's only six spots for you so that's one person at every position yeah and then um you know like an athlete right and so that really makes the competition tough to just be in the first league at all yeah and on top of that, it developed the german players and now you if you watch the nba there are a lot of german players that yeah. play um in the nba morris weasley you've got uh, bonga dennis schroeder is one of the more um uh, daniel tice is there in boston um you've got maxi Kleber. i played all of them every, all of them Wow. Because they all came up through the ranks of playing in the first league in Germany, and then it, at some point um, they they went over went over to play in the NBA. But the league has definitely grown a lot, and um, I was able to take uh, a cool path. So after my third, after my stint in the third league, mm -hmm. I played unbelievable in the in the year. And I did what I think they said one other person had ever done. And I made the jump straight from the third league to the first league. Mm. I think everyone usually goes third and then they move to the second league. And then maybe they take their time and come to the first league. But I went straight to the first league. Um, and it just have been able to, to build a name for myself. And um, it's been really cool. I've played all over this country. I've, I've seen a lot. We also played um, international play. So basketball champions league. Oh. Uh, we played last year and we had a good draw for our, our group was we had Athens, Greece, and we had Jerusalem and we had Spain and France and Belgium and Poland. And, um, and so it's just been a really cool, cool journey to, to be here and play in this league and grow and develop as a player and as a, as a young man. Favorite thing about Germany? I would say the bread. <laughs> 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 they've got unbelievable bread here in germany okay. um but it's really a cool place they um it's clean um really high quality of life they take care of they take care of their citizens mm -hmm. obviously they operate under a socialistic um economic okay. uh, system which works really well yeah. uh, and that, that that's another thing being overseas is just like it opens your mind to what things actually are. You know, I think being in America, I remember I used to think socialism was communism. Like, really, that's actually what I thought it was. Not uncommon. And, <laughs> yeah, until I came here and I'm like, this is nothing like what I, I learned know. in school or what they made it out to be. It's really just holding up the bottom of, of their people. Um, but really a great country. And um, I love the bread I eat. Yeah, I eat in like in the mornings i i'm basically german in that regard 
Um, but a really, really a nice country. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Yeah, I spreche Deutsch. It's perfect. <laughs> Aber es ist, uh, no, it's all. Very good. I do not speak enough German to keep a conversation with you, so I'm not even going to keep going. Um, all right. So last question about your career. Um, what has been your proudest moment as a basketball player overseas? And what do you kind of wish, if anything, you could change? Those two questions. And then we're going to go into the rapid fire. Um, proudest moment was probably last season for me when I played 100 games for my club here, which is rare because in professional basketball overseas, it's pretty much one and done. You play in one place and you go to the next place. Gotcha. And you play in another place and you go to the next place. I've been with this club, not even in this country. I've been with this club four years in a row. Wow. So that was a really, really proud moment for me to be able to do that um, and to be, um, yeah, to be recognized for just being here with these people, playing in front of them, giving everything that I have, being the captain of the team for years. Nice. And um, I really, really enjoyed that. Yeah. And your second question was? Anything you would change uh, if you could about your career there or in general? Yeah, the thing that I wish I would have done is, at, so after my very first year, I had an offer to go play in summer league in China. And I was like, man, I'm tired. This is a long season. <laughs> it was a long season. And I was just like, I want to go home. I want to go see my family. I already knew I was coming back to play in August. You know, it was May or whatever. Right. Um, but I actually wish I would have taken that opportunity because still I was 23, I was young. I could have played a whole year round and been fine. Yeah. Uh, that would have changed the trajectory of my career for sure because I, that would have been the time I would have been playing at the utmost confidence gotcha. like maybe of my career. Um, and then that probably would have ended up in a career in Asia, actually. Mm. Which is that higher money? Is that is that why? Uh, so the people at home know because I don't know anything about it. Yeah. So the first league in China is where a lot of the ex NBA players, the Jeremy Lin's, is like where Stephon Marbury had gone. A lot of those players go there uh, and play because they pay outrageous amounts of money. Um, there's only maybe two foreigners on each team. Yeah. Um, but they live they live really well there. And they haven't come calling since. Well, we have to get, yeah, they don't know. They don't know what they're missing. They don't know. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. You like Germany. It's okay. All right. So uh, last, uh, last two questions, I guess. Well, I mean, we know, but would you ever go back if they, like to the NBA, if they came calling, would you? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I think it'd be great to be there and watch, let my family watch me play. Oh, that's true, because they can't watch all your games. That's true, unless they watch them on. Is there a way for them to watch them on television? Or? They, they watch them online. So we have a, an app that, it's like T-Mobile yeah. TV, but it's here, and they watch it through that. Okay. And uh, the other question is, uh, number one piece of advice on the mental game for any athletes listening. I've never asked any of my other guests this, but I realize I probably should. So I'm going to ask you. So. <laughs> I would say visualize um, what you want your game to look like. Visualize the things that you see yourself succeeding in, what you want to accomplish, and you being your, the best version of yourself in, in each game. Um, because I think that I don't know that a lot of people um, work in visualization, yeah. but I believe in the fact that we can create our realities. Um, and, you know, I was reading The Mindful Athlete with George Mumford, and mm. there was a sentence in there that really shook my, my world. And he was saying that the brain can't tell the difference between a thought and an experience. Yeah. That is insane. So if you think about the things that you think about, right? Right. The things that we think about and so perception really becomes very important because perception is actually reality exactly um and so let's start to perceive some success let's perceive ourselves 
uh, operating at the highest version of our skill set and our talents and our gifting. And I, I think that that would be my advice to people. That's awesome. Yes, 100%. I love the mindful athlete. And uh, yes, those are the two rules that I work with all my athletes. They have to say you're 100% responsible for your life and you create your reality. Because I don't know if there is a reality. There's only your reality, my reality. <laughs> and yes, the brain doesn't know. That's why I, I say it's not about me, but I say like, yeah, be cognizant of what you watch, what you consume. It's all the same. Like it's all imp impacting our mindset. So super powerful. All right, Josh, we're going to go to the rapid fire questions. I hope you're ready. All right. These are tough. What'd you say? I said, let's do it. Oh, okay. All right. I was just making sure. All right. So uh, the number, uh, what superpower would you want and why? What superpower would I want? I mean, I'd, I'd want to be able to fly. I always say that. I think that's what everyone would say, but yeah. I only say it because it's actually what I would want. I, okay. I would actually want to be able to fly. I think that would be so cool. Okay. All right. Yeah. A lot of, that's been the number one answer I've been getting. I'm a teleporter myself because I just want to get there. You obviously want to, you know, go through the sky and do all the cool awesome. stuff. You know what? Can I take that back? Yeah. Right, now that you say teleportation, I'm a big history guy. Okay. I, love, I would love to go back in time and see what things were like in history. That would be that would be better than flying. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I read a lot of different books on, or historical books, and it's just crazy. Like some of the things that have happened in, um, yeah, in former times and the way people were treated. And I think it'd be interesting to be able to be right there and see how that actually uh, played out. Yeah, I know, because you you hear the stories or you see the pictures, but you don't get to actually like you know kind of see like what was it like on the ground in those moments. So absolutely. Yeah. Uh, favorite snack? Well, I think we talked about it already, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, another one, another favorite snack I like. Um, it is, oh man, I have a few. Right now it's this like caramelized popcorn that I'm eating. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's really good. It's, it's how they serve their popcorn here in like the movie theaters. Really? It's more like a caramel, yeah. And so I just grabbed a little bag and it's not the best thing I should be eating, but it's good. So I, <laughs> I indulge a little bit. Well, when you were talking about all that bread, I was thinking, man, how does he stay fit? Because bread, you know. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that bread is good, but I run way too much for it to matter. You run, okay, all right, good. And then uh, the other question, this one's really personal. Uh, in the bathroom and, you know, do uh, you like your toilet paper over the top or under the bottom? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think that as long as I'm able to get to it, it doesn't matter to me. Ah, so you're, it doesn't matter. Okay. So then, no. yeah. So then definitely doesn't, it negates the need for the second question because some people are so specific that they will change it at their house or other people's <laughs> houses. So yes, I know. And my girlfriend is the same as you. She doesn't care. She's just like, whatever. But she does it because she doesn't want to hear from me. Like, I'm like, change it. I'm like, it's got to be this that funny yeah people are super specific <laughs> yeah, i'm telling you and there are people that will change it at other people's houses i am not one of those people but i will change it at my house <laughs> um all right and then uh the next question is uh who is your personal hero who my personal hero is my mother mm. my mother is my personal hero she is uh just amazing She's just amazing. She, obviously, with my father, yeah. also, um, they raised us to be just great. I have four sisters and one brother, and they did a really good job with us. But my mom, she just taught me so much outside of the realm of sports, which I needed for the balance of, of my humanity, really. Yeah. My dad really took care of like, discipline and sports. And my mom was like, hey, diversity, love on people, carry yourself in a certain way, protect your sisters, and um, just some intangible things that I'm, I'm really grateful for and that actually still resonate with me to this day. It's awesome. All right, well, last words, anything you want to say for the people that might be listening uh, as far as athletes or coaches, any last words? Um, just be conscious of the 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 power that we have to influence people. Um, everyone is influencing someone. 
And so being aware of that fact, always being conscious that we're positively influencing people, the words that we speak to people, how powerful they are um, and how people can come into agreement with the words that we say, and that can create someone's reality. Um, and so being very intentional uh, about the things that we do, the things that we say to people, I think is, is so important. And to all my fellow athletes, um, keep pushing forward in your respective sports um, and also understand that there is a major value that you possess outside of the sport that you play. Absolutely. And when, when the ball stops bouncing for me, for other people, when we can't throw that football anymore, kick that soccer ball, um, there is something that's very unique to each individual that you will find, you will find. Um, continue to create your reality, uh, continue to be a light in any situation, especially in today's society, we need it. We need to get our decency back. Um, but that, that's my message to people that it's not just about the talent, um, but more importantly is the gift because the gift will never, it'll never go out, it will always be there. And so discover your gift, develop that gift and give it away every single day. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Josh. Uh, if we want to follow you, where do we find you? And can we watch your games? What do we need to do? Because I'm a fan. So I need to know where do I find more about Josh Young? So I think the easiest place to find me is on Instagram. Okay. Uh, and that is J-A-Y-O-8 underscore. You can find me there. Uh, if you want to follow our brand and business, um, you can follow Competition of One. Okay. Um, that's also on Instagram. For our games, there are some highlights on YouTube, uh, but I would probably have to give you a direct link, which I can do um, when okay. we get one for, for following us in the games. And so those are, those are the easiest ways. Or you can find, find me on Facebook, Josh Young. Um, I've got a page there too. I would love to connect to, to anyone. I love building relationships and connect with people. So I think that'd awesome. be great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. It's just, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. This has been great.